In this video I show you guys how I made these reclaimed shelves that are displayed in a local bookstore. I think they turned out pretty cool and have some unique features, so let's go ahead and hop into the build. To start things off, I'm going to rip down this old barn wood using the bandsaw down to the correct width. And in this video specifically, I plan on just breaking down the tools I used, why I used the tools, why I used what colors, blah blah blah. And not all the videos are going to be like that, but for this specific scene, I chose to use a bandsaw to rip down my boards. Now I usually like using the table saw instead because it gives me a much straighter cut, or I like using the track saw which gives me a perfectly straight cut. But in this scare scenario, I liked using the bandsaw because I wasn't trying to get a straight cut. I was trying to get a parallel cut to the original side, and the original side was not straight remotely. And just to demonstrate that, you see how you can see the light underneath that uh, straight edge? That shows that my cut was not straight, and well, that was the goal. I want the natural kind of rustic wavy side that was just naturally on here because I think that looks really good. It makes it look nice and vintage. And I guess, as you can see, let me move uh, that out of the way. As you can see, it's not perfectly straight. It's got wavy, it's, it's just really old reclaimed barred wood. So to mimic that, using the bandsaw gave me a, a lot similar of edge rather than there being one perfectly straight edge and then one messed up edge. It just wouldn't look right. Now that I have all my boards ripped down to size, the next problem we got to figure out is how to get this cut edge, which you can see here, to look and match the original edge that I did not cut off. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pneumatic chisel. So the first, and yeah, I'll be the first to admit that talking to camera is really awkward, really hard, and I absolutely hate it. But let's go ahead and get back into the actual what I said. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pneumatic paint scraper and I'm just going to cut some chunks out of the edge, make the edge look kind of nice and de-stressed. Maybe take a couple chunks out of the center and, and just kind of make it look more beat up. Also, yeah, I do realize that I need to get a better microphone for this camera. This is my first time actually using this camera and actually, well, editing a video that I took on my camera and using my new microphone with the editing software that I just bought because of the camera. So everything's a learning curve for me right now. I'm trying to figure everything out. Just know and bear with me that every video I promise is going to be better than the last one for at least the first 50 videos. So I've added a couple um, spots where I've taken some chunks out from the center. I particularly like this one where there's a big chunk that I had cut out right here, big chunk that I had cut out right here from the edges, and I tied it together right here through the middle. I think it's a nice little uh, touch where you can actually see the whole section kind of go straight and then dips down and then comes back up over here. I, I think it's going to look really good from the side. And as you can see, there is some like rough, I guess you can't see that. As you can see on the parts that I just cut, there's some kind of like rough, not very organic edges. Like this is a pretty sharp 90 degree corner. So I'm going to use uh, the restorer to get in there and brush it out, kind of smooth everything over, give it more of a nice ease, distressed edge. And I'm just going to be uploading as much as I can and filming, creating as much as I can. So if you like what I'm doing, then keep watching the videos. And if you don't, well, maybe check back in a year. So, to get the color to match, because obviously this bright white raw edge that I've just cut off and cut chunks out of, it, it's raw new wood. So it doesn't have this nice patina that the, the rest of the wood has. So to match that, I'm going to use a combo of products. I'm going to be using the Rubia Monaco Pre-Age Authentic Number no. 3. That is really dark. And where these water spots are, I'm just going to like organically follow there's a water spot here, water spot here, water spot here. I'm gonna tie it in uh, and only put black, the, this pre-aging right there. Cause instead of just randomly splatting it on, my thought process is it looks a lot more natural if you try to follow what's already there, just try to tie it in. If I randomly just like, splatted a bunch of that black on here, it would look really weird. So just by only using it where I need it, it's gonna, it's gonna look good and then to kind of tie that really dark black in, we're going to use this pre-aging smoke. Um, and that 
is kind of a brown that helps it tie into the gray. So instead of just going from black to gray, it's gonna be black, black, brown, gray. And I'm just gonna kind of use that lightly just to tie everything in and make it look good. And there's a couple spots where it's a little bit browner. I'm gonna use that to, to help tie it in. And then as the base coat to get this nice gray patina that's all over the entire board, I'm gonna be using the smoke. It'll turn this yellow to kind of a yellow, or it'll turn this white. It'll turn this white to kind of a grayish yellow and it, it'll look um, really similar to, to this. And I, I think it's gonna turn out really well. So yeah, that was a long way of saying I'm gonna add some colors that makes the new freshly cut edge look old. And this was a super fun process. It took me about an hour and I just, I felt like a child like finger painting. I would totally do this again. Also, sorry for the audio on this next part. It started raining. When I'm putting on this pre-aging, I'm putting just a, enough to kind of puddle up in those cracks so that those will age a little bit deeper. When I come back with the um, <clears throat> restore to kind of help fade and tie in all these different colors, you see it's kind of blotchy right now, but once I hit it with the restore and I, I sand it, it'll kind of tie everything together and, and help it look really smooth and consistent. I actually bought this restore specifically for this project and I love it. I use a 80 grit uh, flap wheel, nylon flap wheel in it, and it worked great. I will definitely use it again for this reclaimed look. I want it to look like that these boards um, had just, we found these boards and that they happen to be the perfect dimensions for this build. So to make that look a reality, I'm going to use these cut saw files and just kind of beat up this edge, make it look like, you know, a thousand hands have rubbed over this edge and just kind of warmly rolled it over and give it a nice worn look. Um, but it also leaves us these kind of nice scratches on them. It has a really weird non-traditional file texture and it, it, it looks more like a, uh, like, cat claws uh, scratched it almost. It has a really cool look that it fit really well. Once I'm done with that, I'm gonna move on to adding the color to the end. And this was a little bit more tricky. I had to be a little bit more delicate with it because the end grain was absorbing so much of the color that um, I just had to like barely dab my towel and get it wet or else it would just get super dark super quick like you can see happened here. I added a little bit too much here but it was no problem. I was able to sand it all off with the restorer and get a nice even look. And speaking of the restorer, I'm going to take the restorer to the surface of each one of the boards to get that kind of gray patina off for the most part, but it's going to leave a super nice detailed texture. Also, if some of the camera quality looks really good, some of it looks really bad, one is because I uh, didn't understand how lighting was going to work, and if I have the light in the frame, it looks really weird. And two, half of this was filmed on my phone with a cracked camera, and half of it was filmed on my really nice new camera. So now this board right here. Oh, I grabbed the hook I'm like a pirate. <laughs> right, that's better. As you can see, um, so this is the board that I went ahead and restored. Um, it has just finished drying. You can see uh, that gray comes out a lot more once it's dry. I still haven't sanded it yet, but um, I haven't sanded this one either. And they look good. They look really similar. They don't have, you know, quite the circular saw marks, but um, I, it, it's pretty close. Um, I didn't have a circular saw that would have that aggressive as a cut. So I opted for the band saw and I, I feel like it did pretty good. Once this is sanded and, and this side is sanded, I, I think that um, this side and this side will tie together a lot closer and both of these sides will tie together with the face really well. So along with that restorer that I bought specifically for this project, I also bought this pneumatic sander specifically for this project because I knew I was going to have at least four hours of edge sanding and I really like this pneumatic sander. I even bought an air compressor and an extra air tank for it, and I'm getting ready to buy a whole new air compressor so I could run this pneumatic sander even longer and faster. Uh, I was one of those tools I was really hesitant to buy because I don't see woodworkers normally using them, but uh, it works great. It's super easy to control on the edge. It's super comfortable. The variable speed is awesome, and I love it all around. All I need is a bigger air compressor.
So even though this sander looks like a finish sander, a finish sander that vibrates up and down, it actually, it's hard to tell, but it does, if you look, move in a circle. <laughs> So it moves in a circle in the same random orbit pattern as one of these sanders. So this one moves, spins in a circle, and the actual pad itself rotates in a circle, if you can see that. So the scratch patterns, a bunch of little swirls. Really, oh, you can't see that at all very tiny but little little squirrels if you're using like an 80 grit you can actually see the swirls in the wood john katnosis has a great video where he sands on acrylic glass and you can really see the swirls a lot clearer but both these sand that same way but the main difference is when i sand with this one and i let go this isn't going to kind of jump around and go all crazy because it's really heavy and it has that extra spinning motion so it kind of stabilizes it out so if i turn it on and let go this is what happens you know nothing crazy it just kind of falls around if i hold the lever down on this one, but don't direct it. It jumps around like crazy. It tries to bounce off and go wild. It's a lot harder to control this one on the face than that one. But when it comes to stuff like this, like sanding on an edge, this is a lot easier to use because this is super light, super easy to control, and it has variable speed. So I can change how I'm sanding as I'm sanding. So on the edges, I'm barely pushing. On this part, I let it go fully. And if I use this sander, on the edges. It's really heavy. It tips. It's really tippy. And that spinning motion on the edge, when it's spinning, as soon as it catches, it's actually going to push and pull it out of my hand. So it's really hard to do. It also, since this has such a firm pad on it, I'm not even going to test it to show you on this. It'll um, tear up and take way too much material off the corner because of how firm the pad is. Where on this sander, I have a really, whoops, really squishy pad on there. And this is only my medium one. I have an even squishier pad if I need it. So I just want to show you guys why I don't use this on small edges. As you can see, the sandpaper right here, there's actually a hole on the Velcro pad right here. So anytime it hits the corner, a lot of the time, it'll warp this sandpaper or it'll just completely rip through it. Usually I use the mesh sandpaper, but I'm using this um, barely hold sandpaper because when I'm sanding the edges, these holes don't get caught and they don't rip. And this pad on this is completely flat and firm and I can sand on any part of this and not tear up the sandpaper. This one board had a really big knot hole in it and it just didn't quite fit in with the rest of the boards. So I chose to fill it with hot glue and I know hot glue is not epoxy, but if you get the right hot glue, it's really hard, really solid when works the Pretty much the exact same, looks the exact same, and is 10 times easier to, to repair than normal epoxy. And on something like this where it has that rough surface, the epoxy will kind of leak into there and will be impossible to get out. So it was really important for me to use something that I can kind of sculpt and use a heat gun and, and you know use my little hooks to push it all together and get it perfectly lined up. 
on that same board, there was also this pretty gnarly crack, which seemed like it was mostly stable, but to be extra safe, I went ahead and filled it with wood glue. Um, the crack, like, almost didn't go all the way through. I don't know, it was really hard to tell. So I just used my air compressor to blow the glue in as deep as I possibly could. Again, I didn't want to use epoxy because I didn't want it to spread out and then get into all the little cracks and stuff and I won't be able to get it out kind of thing. But anyways, let's move on to the legs. Or I guess they're not technically legs. They're like shelf supports, but they look like legs. Either way, I used the stop block to cut them all out of these really cool like big log looking things. And you can see here, I'm just kind of setting everything up just to make sure it all looks good together. And at this point, while I was dancing on the table, I realized a major problem. It's super sturdy, but the legs or supports, whatever the hell you want to call them, are 10 times darker than the actual wood itself. So I need to figure out some way to tie everything together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sand, use the restorer and sand these like stumps as much as possible to try to get them a lighter color but that didn't end up really working that good it kind of turned gray and as you can see here the other stuff is still way too light so i'm gonna have to add a dark chocolatey color to the actual shelves themselves and it ended up tying together really really well and i didn't even have to add the chocolate color to the legs themselves when I added the clear coat, it ended up that with that nice chocolatey color just naturally, which was awesome to see. But anyways, back to the legs. Or, they're not legs, but whatever. I'm going to call them legs for the rest of the video just to make it easier. I used a little jig to mark the center of each one of the legs so that I could drill a hole so I could use a dowel to connect all of the pieces together. It was really important to the customer that this was super easy and super quick to take apart. So I'm not really going to hard fix everything together. It's just going to have these dowel pins and everything's just going to sit on top of each other and kind of lock in place that way. And I'm going to offset the holes um, on the shelves themselves a little bit from the legs. So then it will kind of act like a spring and lock itself in place. And you can see here I'm cutting the dowels and getting everything fitted up. It uh, ended up being like an inch away from the edge. It looked really good. And I'm just making a small mark for where I need to drill the hole. I scooted it slightly closer to the edge, like I was saying, so it acts like a spring. And this is a cool little trick to find the center of a hole that you've already drawn on something. I just try to roughly find the middle and I draw like 20 or so lines on it and whatever's in the middle of all those lines intersecting is usually super close to the center and again it doesn't have to be 10,000% perfect you know it's just got to be close enough to where it's repeatable and after I made this first hole I used a little jig like I'm making here and I used that jig to mark all the other holes so they're all the exact same so even if I was a little bit off they'll all be the exact same no matter what and you can see here it's a nice tight fit that will be sturdy and will lock together surprisingly firmly now that I have all the dowels cut and everything is sort of locking together good. I actually decided on the bottom level, I'm going to add some threaded inserts and some screws just so it's extra sturdy. You know, there's going to be a lot of weight on these and I just don't want somebody to bump into it. And it, it most likely won't tip over, but I just want to be extra, extra safe. So on the bottom level, these are going to be screwed together. It's just two Phillips, super easy to take in and out with that threaded insert. Once I got the threaded inserts done for the bottom level, I am going to glue in the dowels for the top level. Uh, it just kind of made sense to glue it into one of the side. I, not necessarily necessary, but um, I kind of thought it fit better. And with it being glued into the top, it was a little easier to move the heavier pieces around, which are those kind of leg log areas. So it just kind of made sense to glue it into the top shelf. Once I had gotten that top one glued in, I'm just going to start taking everything apart and gluing in all the rest of the dowels. The middle dowels are going to be glued into the bottom of the leg, and then the lower dowels are going to be glued into the bottom shelf itself. Now I'm just going to use this little jig I made to mark the threaded insert for the little adjustable feet, the little leveling feet. Since these are reclaimed boards, they're all kind of twisted and warped weird, so it was pretty important for me to put these little leveling feet on there. 
And I probably should have marked these holes before I put that dowel on, because you can kind of see it's tipping back and forth while I'm trying to mark the holes and drill into it. It was kind of a pain, but, you know, it wasn't too bad. And this is one of my favorite little tips and tricks I picked up from John Catmosis, is using that blue tape as a depth stop on any drill bit. It works super good, it's super easy to adjust, and I don't know, I just thought it was really cool when he showed that. And here's how I do my threaded inserts. I just use some of the thick CA glue, and I pour all the way around the threaded insert itself. Then I use my Milwaukee electric screwdriver and a mandrel that I made, and I just back it all the way in there, and I set the torque that it needs um, so it'll automatically stop at the right depth, and then it just easily pops out that uh, mandrel and I dropped it right through that dog hole and you will not believe how long it took me to find that mandrel. These are the feet I decided to use. I really like the look of them. They're kind of just like a more plain uh, black steel look opposed to a lot of the other ones that they sell at Lowe's are a plasticky kind of cheap look. And uh, these ones don't come with a felt pad on them but that's fine because I have plenty of dark felt pads and I just he stuck it on there. I didn't use any CA glue or anything. It stuck on there real nice. And here goes that color correction I was talking about. This was kind of a scary step because when I was putting it on there, it looked really, really dark. But in the test samples I did, it just it looked like the right uh, amount of color. And uh, just I think the way I was putting it on with this sponge brush made it super super dark but once I really started getting in there with some blue paper towel and wiping it around getting in there with a polishing pad it, it really toned down the color and started looking a lot better and once I put a clear coat on this is the final result I think it looks really awesome and I think it matched um the store went in super super well. I haven't really built something like this in a very long time. I don't usually do reclaimed wood stuff like this. You can see that um, hot glue, how good it looks. It looks just like epoxy and it matches the kind of curves and it, I kind of was able to mold it like Play-Doh. But anyways, it looked really good and I'm really really happy with it. The client was super happy with it. Once she got all the books and everything on it, it just made an awesome display case and I just, I love the project. And this is one of those projects that I wasn't super psyched on originally, hence the bad filming. But um, I love it, and I will definitely do more projects like this in the future. I didn't think it was going to turn out nearly as good as it did, but I just something about it is so badass. I just really like the way it looks. If you liked this project or the video or hated it, feel free to let me know in the comments. I'm happy to hear how horrible you think it looks. Um... Follow me on Instagram, White Squirrel Woodworking, uh, subscribe, I'm going to be trying to posting a lot higher quality of videos, this one was pretty rough, but um, I had a lot of fun making it, and uh, hopefully I can make some more videos that you guys will like.